I have the most amazing opportunity today to talk to Dr. Richard Watson, who is um, someone that I ran across through the work of Michael Levin from watching um, Michael Levin's academic channel. And I've seen many conversations with Richard and Michael and uh, Ian McGilchrist and other thinkers that uh, we've been interested in in our little corner. And um, I, I asked Richard to come on today to talk about a new theory that he has developed, which I think is really fascinating. But first, Richard, I wonder if you could tell a little bit about your background, maybe a bit about how you grew up and um, what got you interested in the fields that you are currently endeavoring in. Uh, so my background was uh, computer science. I did an undergraduate degree in artificial intelligence and then a master's in knowledge-based systems. But meanwhile, I was sort of moving around a bit from, I grew up in the UK, went to Australia for a few years, went to do my PhD in the States at Brandeis University, and then a postdoc at Harvard in the biology department. And then my research was sort of changing fields a little bit in, the, in so much as I had been studying the algorithm of evolution by natural selection within computer science as in a sort of an engineering method inspired by biology. Uh, but I was always motivated by uh, the biological questions and whether that algorithm was sufficient to explain how biological, biological evolution worked. Uh, and since then, I've been uh, continuing to try to answer that question, really. It's like, how, how does the algorithm of biological evolution work and to what extent does natural selection, the theory of evolution by natural selection, um, is it, to what extent is it sufficient or insufficient for answering that question? Mm. Does, does the theory of biological evolution work as an algorithm in computer science? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you can very simply um, reproduce a, a variation and selection process in a computer. So you want to solve a problem and you have some way of assessing whether guesses at solving that problem are good or not. So you make a hundred random guesses get the computer to make a hundred random guesses and you evaluate which ones are good and which ones are not good. And to start with, they're all rubbish, but some of them are slightly less rubbish than others. So you keep those and you discard the more rubbish ones and you make copies of the ones that you kept and you go around again and you're doing a variation and selection process inside the computer to, as a way of solving an optimization problem. Um, so that's a, it's a reasonably, well, uh, simple but faithful um, interpretation of the algorithm of evolution by natural selection um, applied to a what we would call a fixed fitness function. So you have an objective function that evaluates how good things are, and you use that to decide which ones you keep and which ones you discard. So you do have a function that make that does the deciding. You have something that measuring up against. It's matching up yeah. with something. Yeah. So that function doesn't know. Um, what form an answer would take, but it's a function that can tell you how, what the quality of an answer is. So, uh, for example, if you were evolving the structure of a bridge, the function can tell you how successful the bridge is, what the maximum span is, or the maximum load is, but that function doesn't, can't tell you how to build a bridge. It can only tell you how good the bridge was whether it's successful in terms of fitness. So it's, it's all yeah. about fittedness to a yeah. task. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So through this whole process, you've been thinking about evolution and in the thinking about natural selection, you came to some conclusions and that's caused you to draft this very interesting theory, which consists right now of five YouTube videos, <laughs> which haven't been published yet. Mm. And I've watched all five of them at least three times, some of them more. And that's good staying power. Thank you. <laughs> as I as I'm doing it, I grasp it as I go along. But I get to the end of the fifth video every time and I'm like, wait a minute, how did that work? again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so much. It's so much. I mean, I don't know how you took an idea that big and broke it down into into a format that actually makes sense. I mean, I think it's really remarkable. Um, so I wouldn't ask you to try to 
delineate the entire thing for people today, but maybe you could give us uh, the basic idea, a basic thread, and then I have some questions that have occurred to me while I've been watching over and over. Yeah. Um, so that algorithm of um, evolution by natural selection that I just described, which is reasonably faithful to the algorithm that Darwin described, um, is supposed to explain the adaptive complexity of all living organisms. Uh, and there are uh, some aspects of evolutionary biology and biology that are not well accommodated in that theory. So there are some things which it sort of logically can't do. It can't explain its own origin, right? The theory of evolution by natural selection can't explain the origin of life or indeed the origin of the evolutionary algorithm. You have to start with things that reproduce with heritable variation in order for evolution to proceed, but it doesn't explain where the self-reproducing entities came from. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't explain how the parameters of that process change in a way that makes that process better over time because that would require a sort of meta-evolution, a sort of evolution of the evolutionary parameters, that, or the evolution of evolvability it's sometimes called, which people speculate about, but it gets sort of gets itself tied in knots when a theory tries to explain its own axioms. And the third thing that it can't do, which, is, which has been a lot of my focus, is it can't explain the transitions in individuality. So like from single-celled life to multi-celled life, where the evolutionary process is instantiated, a rescaled at a new scale, a new level of organization at the multicellular level of the multicellular organism, so that previously adaptations served the interests of the parts, the individual cells, and now the adaptations of the cells serve the interests of the collective. They are, in a sense, subservient to the adaptation of the whole. Um, so a conventional natural selection story struggles to explain all of those things. And if you don't have explanations for those things, you don't, you know, they're not just minor details, right? They are pretty important to our understanding of the evolution of life on earth. Otherwise we would just be talking about which of these self-replicating molecules, which by the way, we don't know how they began self-replicating is best at living in this mud. Right, that's all we'd be talking about. Which one is replicating fastest would be the end of the story. And we wouldn't have this account of entities at one level of organization working together to create a higher level of organization, working together to create a higher level of organization and so on, which is where the real engine of the creativity and complexity comes from in living systems. So those, I became sort of dissatisfied with natural selection as an explanation for those particular phenomena. By the way, I should clarify, this is not to say that evolution by natural selection isn't true in the sense of it does occur. Populations do have individuals that are different from each other. Those differences do matter to their survival and reproduction. And the ones that survive and reproduce better leave more descendants in the next generation. So when those conditions are met, evolution by natural selection occurs, and it does. And it seems quite likely that if it didn't, biological evolution wouldn't happen. But that doesn't mean that you've explained everything you wanted to explain. Um, the other thing that uh, is troublesome about it, which is sort of troublesome about all reductionist science, is that when you want to explain something complex, beautiful and interesting, you take it apart to its smallest pieces. You uh, label and examine the pieces and the relationships between them, and you say, that's how it works. And often the thing that you wanted to explain actually turns out to be something which is explained away. It's like, that's not even a thing. We don't talk about that anymore, right? So we don't talk about what life is. We just talk about how proteins work. Likewise, we don't talk about what minds are. We just talk about how neurons send electrical signals to one another. Mm -hmm. um, we don't even talk about what the organizing principles of the universe are. We just talk about, you know, well, there's masses and forces and particles and subatomic particles. And, you know, it's all just one thing pushing another. It's like there's, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see inside the head. There's nothing to see inside the evolutionary process. And the evolutionary process is 
oh, well, that turns out that it's just genes, some of which are increasing in frequency and some of which are decreasing in frequency, and that's it. Like, there's nothing to see here, right? There's nothing, there's nothing, um, there's no principle there that explains what you really wanted to explain, which was the complexity, diversity, beauty of living things and how they change over time. So that's a sort of general problem of reductionism, which is, you know, throughout all of the sciences, but in particular in, to my interest in evolutionary biology, it's like, are we going to say that the evolution of organisms is simply the evolution of all of the genes that they contain? And on, that seems like it sort of has to be true if you believe that all of the heritable information is one way or another in the genes. I'm not sure that it is, but even if you do believe that that's true, you haven't yet explained, but, but why did they evolve that way? Well, because the selective pressures on the genes made them evolve that way. But why were the selective pressures on the genes evolved in such a way that the genes evolved into this amazing multicellular organism and not into some really fast replicating single molecule in the mud, right? Why did it make it evolve towards these advanced higher levels of complexity? Mm -hmm. And some people get very upset about that. You say, oh, well, you shouldn't be progressive about explaining how evolution works, right? There's, there's still plenty of simple life forms. Don't go putting complex life forms at the top of some ladder or something like that. And I don't want to do that. But let's put it this way. When you run an algorithm based on the principles of natural selection inside a computer, nothing interesting happens ever, right? Nothing interesting happens ever. It gets better at whatever the objective function was, you set it. And if you started off with components which were already intrinsically interesting, then it refines them a bit, but it never does those leaps in complexity that you see in biological evolution. So that was the motivating stuff. Well, so one thing, um, so my husband is in high tech, um, and for a while he was thinking maybe he would want to gravitate over to AI. And so he took a few classes in that. One of the things that he was learning, he showed me um, about how they use uh, opponent processing and machine learning hmm. to get more creativity going, to get these two, um, I'm not sure what, two algorithms, two programs working against each other. Yeah. And then once in a while they kind of, filter in some some noise, some stochasticity, which also kind of in some way or another amps up the signal so the opponent processing can develop more creativity. It, does, that, um, does that resonate at all? Yeah, it does. So you can, there are analogs of that in evolution. So instead of having one system, one machine learning system learning in opposition or inter interaction to another learning system. You can have one evolving population evolving uh, in interaction with another evolving population. So we call that a co-evolutionary process. And in a sense, the co-evolutionary dynamic is that each one is pushing the other to become a better, to be better able to respond to the adaptation of the first in a sort of co-evolutionary arms race. It's still uh, difficult though, to get a system like that to become a higher level entity, right? So I've got A, which is evolving and I've got B, which is evolving. And now I've got A, which is evolving in response to B and B, which is revolving, evolving in response to A. But I've still just got two things evolving instead of one thing evolving. I didn't create a new level of organization, which harnesses, subverts, or directs the evolution of the think of the components it contains. And the sort of conventional way of understanding natural selection is that, well, you don't need to, that's not really a thing that didn't really happen. You know, just, just stick with describing the parts, that's all there is to describe. You know, the Dawkins would describe the organism as just a vehicle, just the lumbering robot that's controlled by the genes. Uh, which means that that higher level entity has no causal role in what actually happens, right? It's just a, an arena in which the genes play out their co-evolution, um, which I think 
you know misses the point right what we what we wanted to explain was how the whole became more than the sum of the parts in not so much that it not just that it had emergent properties that the parts didn't have but that it begins to play a causal role in the direction of those processes and that's a we would call that sort of top-down causation and we don't have a good a good way of explaining what top-down causation how it works or even what it is how would you know it when you saw it it's kind of difficult well one of the things as you know that i play with because we've been corresponding for quite a while about this stuff is that the idea of the principles of art um, seem to show up in all these arenas and one of the fundamental principles of art is the necessity for dominance because dominance produces unity in the work and um uh, I know that sounds a little weird, but let me let me show you in terms of uh, a human being how dominance right. would work in that sense. They say that numerically, bacteria are dominant in us. Mm -hmm. Is that about right? The number of bacteria yeah. is probably the dominant. The number of bacterial cells is much greater than the yeah. number of our cells. Yeah. Okay, so so the bacteria are dominant. Um, so in some way, those bacteria are serving the whole. Would that? Uh, well, they might be, but I, uh, there might have been we, a. Leak. We don't know, but they might be. Mm. But in another way, the brain is also dominant because the brain makes the decisions that decide whether or not this body lives. So, in a way, the brain is serving the bacteria. There's a synergistic relationship between them. Yes. Yeah. So, so each has a different kind of dominance. So when you're looking at a painting, the the dominance that creates the unity in the painting is typically the dominance of, um, let's say, the real estate in the painting, because the focal point is usually the smallest, small region that you that you want to draw the eye towards, but the entirety of the painting is there to support and draw the eye towards the focal point. But the focal point is kind of the reason for the journey. <laughs> and so so the focal point is one kind of dominance, but the the substrate and the rest of the painting supporting the focal point is another kind of dominance. Mm -hmm. So each is meaningless without the other. In a sense, yeah. So you mm -hmm. have the you have the bottom up and the top down, but they have to work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the musical analog of that that makes that resonates with with me there is um when you think about um the relationship between the molecules of steel in a guitar string and the note that it plays right so when you pluck the guitar string and vibrations are sent along the string uh the string finds the resonant frequency, it converts that energy into a particular frequency, the note of that string, say a G. Um, but how does it do that? What's really going on? How would you explain what's happening there? So one way to explain why the molecules of the string are in a particular position at a particular point in time is to say, well, this molecule is in this position because the molecule either side of it pulled it into that position. Mm -hmm. okay well why were those molecules where they were well because the molecules either side of them pulled them into what the position they were okay so why were, were they all up here and not all down there well you know that's the phase of the of the oscillation you know that what, what does that mean well i'm going to switch now to describe it as a, a note, a frequency, which is held on the string, and that frequency resonates on that string, and only that frequency resonates on that string, or that frequency and its harmonics. And that's why uh, the string is moving up and down in a coherent fashion in a way that fits in that geometry of the string. Oh, okay, so you fit, you switch there from the molecule is where it is because the molecules next to it made it be there, to all of the molecules of where they are, because that's the geometry of the string as a whole. The, the context of the whole, the geometry of the whole, the length of the string, 
determines why the molecules are all up and then they're all down and then they're all up and then they're all down. That um, synchronized movement of the molecules is determined by the geometry of the string as a whole, its length, and not by the individual molecules. And you can use a, you know, the, the physics of resonance to link those two things together, that you have a, an energetic vibration on the string that comes from your plucking it. And those vibrations zip along the string in both directions until they reach the end of the string. And then they're reflected and they come back again. And the wave going this way meets the wave going that way. And if the wavelength of that vibration reflects in such a way that when they meet each other coming back again, they are in phase, then they build up and the oscillation is stronger. But if they're out of phase, then they don't build up. And whether they are in phase or not is an interesting negotiation between the detailed mechanics of the string of how much bend it likes, can tolerate, how much it push back from a bend, and the length of the string as a whole. Right, that's the the wavelength of the of the wave that's moving along the string, and the length of the string that determines whether the reflection meets itself in phase or out of phase. And the tension at either end of the string. The tension of the string as the, as a whole, yeah. Yeah. Um. So when they are not in phase, that produces a kink in the string, which the string doesn't like, and that causes one of them to try and move past the other. That creates a vibration that's not just in the plane now, but starts to rotate around as well until it moves that energy into uh, a different phase that can combine and then um, convert the energy of the original vibration into the energy that's all in the fundamental frequency. And that um, involves a process of a sort of negotiation between the microscopic properties of the steel and the geometric properties of the string as a whole um, that uh, the resulting answer to why is this molecule of string where it is involves both the macro scale and the micro scale to answer that question. So then you have a system there, but that system is also responding to a larger environment, which contains those laws of physics that are pr producing those uh, resonant frequencies. Yeah. Which you know, I mean, that that's another system. And then beyond that, there's probably a system. So each system is responding to its own, I, I don't know, I guess, um, Michael Levin would call it its own training environment. Yeah, it's a it's you can imagine a um, an oscillator is sustained by creating a resonant oscillation in its environment. But they are resonant oscillation in the environment is sustained by the oscillation of the original resonator so there's a there's a, a complementarity between any system that you're looking at and the environment that it's placed in that if that complementary complementarity isn't there then the crashing together of those two dynamics um transforms each of those two systems you can think of it, it just bends them, crushes them, crashes them, and, you know, changes them through the clash of those two dynamics meeting. But they will necessarily be transformed in that collision into a configuration where they are not clashing, right? They rattle until they don't rattle anymore, right? They in discord until they find harmony. And that um, ability to convert the organization of the system and the out the environment of the system into dynamics which are complementary is what enables that dynamic to sustain for as long as it does. It's never in it's never wholly enduring, if the Buddhists would say. It's always a non-enduring self, but to the extent that it does sustain, it's because of that complementarity between it and its environment. So then the stress that's causing the clash is actually where the learning takes place. Yeah. So is kind of what your whole theory learning is, about learning is the failure to stay the same, right? Or learning is the success of not being static. <laughs> um, 
if uh, if a system doesn't change, it isn't learning anything. By definition, it's just doing the same behavior over and over again. And when a system's behavior is in um, tension or stress in its relationship to its environment, that uh, causes a transformation in the dynamics of the system. And the transformation in the dynamics of the system is literally changing it into another system. Um, changing its dynamics, modifying its dynamics, it's uh, forced by the mismatch between itself and the environment in a way that creates a sort of potential energy or tension or stress within the system. And the rearrangement of the components of the system to relieve that stress is what we call learning. It's, and so it's really the same thing as changing into a form that is complementary to the environment is learning, which Friston would call minimizing surprise. If it becomes a good, if the agent becomes a good model of the environment, it's not surprised by anything. If it is surprised by something, the surprise causes it to change. It's a, it's a, I would interpret that as a literal forcing on the relationships between the components. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what I think um, Jordan Peterson would call motivated exploration. <clears throat> The mismatch or the cognitive, um, when, when you get up to another scale, um, the um, cognitive dissonance that happens when, when my reality doesn't match reality, <laughs> then that creates a, a, a motivated exploration because you have to find a way around or a way through that obstacle or that anomaly, right? That's right. I mean, so the alternative is that you motivated can... towards what motivated towards learning, but, but why is, why is learning better? Why is learning good? Yeah. Why not just carry on believing what you believed before and live with the stress? Yeah. Or why not just carry on being that single celled organism that continues to proliferate and doesn't go any farther? Yeah. So I, I think of the, of the, stress is actually being the cause right the mm -hmm. the the if the if the mismatch between the agent and the environment is has no pattern to it then the stress that's caused inside the agent has no pattern to it and can't cause any coherent rearrangement of the relationships among the parts but if there is some repeating pattern in the discord between the agent and the environment, then that will create a stress inside the agent, which has pattern to it. And having pattern to it means that it produces a consistent little nudge that each time we're going around, you get a little nudge. Each time you're going around, you get a little nudge. When it was incoherent, you get it goes around this time, you get a little nudge this way. It goes around the next time, you get a little nudge back again, and you didn't you didn't get any net change. But if there's a resonance between the the stress in the system and the the pattern of the dynamics of the stress and the behavior of the system, then it nudges the system into a different shape, into a different uh, organization of the relationships among the parts. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about what you mean when you say pattern? Yeah, so um, the the word that I've been using for the dynamical pattern that I'm referring to is song. So by a song, I mean a collection of uh, dynamical oscillations, physical dynamical oscillations that are in harmonic relationship to one another. So a collection of dynamical oscillations uh, between coupled oscillators, which are not harmonically related to one another that are going to keep causing each other to change but when they are harmonically related then they produce a stable pattern over time so that it can be a temporally extended dynamic which contains many frequencies in a harmonic relationship which eventually will repeat or almost repeat that it sort of it has an, an element of uh, cycling even if it doesn't get back to exactly the same place each time and that song that is a 
it's a temporal pattern. It's a dynamic that changes over time, but it also has a causal, uh, it's a causal process in creating physical organization among the components. So if the components are, um, if you place a suitably um, sensitive material next to something which is vibrating with a particular pattern, then the vibration will induce a structure in that material that makes it accommodate to that vibration. And then you can take away the source and the material is holding on to the song, right? The structural pattern which has been induced in the structure of the material uh, carries on ringing to the detail of the song that was played to it. It's a kind of transfer of information. So the song this is, is both- similar, This is similar to Michael Levin's idea about how placebo can be used to kind of um, generate its own healing. If the placebo and the medication are um, given at the same time, the medication can be removed at a certain place and the placebo will accomplish the same purpose. Well, th that's what you'd like to happen with all medical interventions, right? That right. there's- I mean, that, that's there's what a, he's shooting for, I think. In the future. There's, a, there's a period in it of intervention where you're literally pushing and then you want it to find a new attractor such that mm -hmm. now you can take away the intervention, intervention and it is healed, mm -hmm. right? That it carries on in mm -hmm. that new dynamic and that new dynamic has less stress in it, right? That's what, that's what you'd like any medical intervention to be, uh, which is not really different from learning, right? Which is mm -hmm. you know, healing and learning are really finding a new arrangement so that you're less stressed by the environment. Mm -hmm. So an intervention which is, has the job of healing would be one which nudges you into a new attractor or a new arrangement uh, that makes you less stressed by or less surprised by your own interaction with the environment thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that in, if you think that things only work bottom up, then the way that you would do that intervention is with a drug. You would say, well, everything is controlled by the genes and the genes make the proteins and the proteins make the cells and the cells make the tissues and the tissues make the organs and the organs make the organism. So if I want to change any of that, I need to change it at the bottom because that's the way that the causal flow goes from bottom to top. Mm -hmm. But if you think that it's the self, the individual, the whole that makes... Uh, that creates the thoughts in the head, that creates the speed of the pulse of the heart, that creates the movements of the body and the muscle, that creates the electrical activity in the tissues, that creates the gene expression in the cells, that creates the expression of the genes that were creating the proteins. If it goes in that direction, well, then you could do healing by just creating the right mental state instead of, and that would change everything downwards instead of providing a drug, which then changed everything upwards. Mm -hmm. So both are possible in principle, right? It's clear that uh, you can do interventions at the bottom level and get consequences at the top level, right? If you mm -hmm. poison somebody, the whole thing dies, right? <laughs> and sometimes you can give them a drug that actually makes them better. Uh, and it's also true that you cannot, it's not just that you can make people feel better by suggestion mm -hmm. and you can, but you can also making them feel better makes them better, right? Making them feel better changes their entire physiology, which changes the, uh, the operation of all of the parts, which changes the gene expression, right? Why am I depressed? Because my genes were making my cells produce too much of this brain chemical. Why were your genes doing that? Well, because your mental state was depressed. If your mental state was depressed, then of course they're going to produce the drug that makes that supports that, right? It can, the causal process can be both ways. You can break that cycle by an intervention at the bottom level, 
or intervention at the top level. You can break depression with talking therapy. You can break depression with drugs. Both of those things are involved in causal connections, bottom up and top down. To imagine that it's only bottom up would say, you know, talking therapy doesn't fix anything, right? You're gonna, you should only use drugs. And if you think that talking therapy can fix something, uh, then it also makes sense that the belief that you've been fixed or the belief that you've received an intervention that you've been fixed, i.e. a placebo, does change something. But it didn't change anything. I didn't actually give you anything. It's like, yeah, you did. You gave me something which changed my mental state. And the change in the mental state is causal just as much as a drug is or can be if expertly. Well, I apologize for getting you diverted so often. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. You were, you were right in the middle of, of uh, kind of laying out the, the theory of uh, life as a song, mm. or mind as a song. And uh, you described uh, the pattern as a, the song as a physical dynamical oscillation that's in harmonic resonance. Yeah. And to me, that sounded a lot like marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Because marriage also includes includes those stressors that that lead to um, lead to change and transformation and uh, future resonance at a at a different level, maybe a meta level of some kind. Yeah, and you have a choice to a vulnerable leaning in, or I've had enough of this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the, when you when when that. Uh, interaction causes stress you'd say you can you can meet it with vulnerability that is an opportunity for transformation or not <laughs> you say, well I'm i mean take it back stress, down to the song but... in a song whenever there is a uh, some sort of stress or clash or atonal something going on in a song yeah typically that is there, it it desires resolution. It creates yeah. a desire for resolution, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, if it creates a desire for resolution, like resolution is needed, resolution is satisfying, why would an artist have created the discord in the first place? Why not just start with everything in harmony and never produce any discord or never produce any counterpoint? It's like, well, because then it wouldn't be a thing at all. Right. If mm -hmm. you just wanted the a piece of music that was maximally harmonious, you would just play one note. And the notes which are most harmonious with that are, well, that note, right? Just more of that note, right? Then there's never it's never even any tension at all. Don't even play a chord of two notes. That's because that creates an interval that suggests a third note. And you don't want that, right? Mm -hmm. If you were just trying to maximize uh the the um minimize the discord in the system then you wouldn't play any notes at all uh but the the creation of the tension as you say uh um what was the word that you used i would use, i use the word summons the notes which um resolve that tension yeah i like that summons yeah it draw it draws it right <clears throat> Yes, I, the word incantation, I to, which means you know to sing or chant, but it also means a spell. Mm -hmm. uh, the the cyclic rhythmic sound, the sound of the words or the sounds of the chant, uh, is intended to summon something that wasn't there, right? That's not in the words and was not in the material realm. Uh, and the, the note that is suggested when you, when you play a perfect fifth, right, and it suggests the octave above, uh, that, that suggestion um, is drawn into existence by the complementarity of the interval between the notes you've already played. Um, and I think that you can, you can get musical harmony to do that work for you in saying where did where did the creative stuff come from 
And the way that natural selection tries to explain it is, well, we don't worry where the creative stuff comes from. That's just random. We'll just let selection do all the work of keeping the stuff that was good and discarding the stuff that wasn't. But it doesn't do any explanatory work in saying, but, but where did the new hypothesis come from? Where did the new variants come from? So you don't need to worry about that. That's just random. But when you think about it, instead of particular things being drawn into existence by virtue of the tension created by the things that are already there, that suggests that the variation is not random. The variation is drawn in to fill the space that's made. Well, so let's go down the level because this is the thing that always fascinates me. I've been thinking about this for years. Where does the anomaly come from? The thing that causes the stress in the first place, where does that come from? Um, lags. Lags, okay. Yeah. Say more. <laughs> yeah. So is um, this going towards your your viscoelastic structure? Yeah. So the the if you have if the if your oscillation traveled through space instantaneously, then everything everywhere would be in phase with this oscillation all the time and no tension would ever be created. But if in traveling through space, the wave takes time, then when it comes back around and meets itself, sometimes it's not in phase with itself. So on the guitar string, that's like, you know, the wave is happily traveling along the string and then it reflects off the other end and starts coming back again. And as it meets itself, if it's in phase, that's fine. But if it's out of phase, um, that creates a tension that needs to be resolved. But how can it be out of phase with itself, right? How can I be out of phase with myself, right? Well, only because there was a lag, because I went over there and came back again. And by the time I got back, I had slipped a little bit. And now I'm not in phase with myself. So I think that in, you know, it's, it's a little bit, there's a, you know, there's a deep metaphysical story there somewhere, but uh, in a guitar string, that reflection is just happening at the end of the string because the instrument maker put the string on the fret at one end and the key at the other end. Um, but in the physics of the universe, I think that's about how waves travel through space and how long it takes before they meet each other going around in some sort of loop to meet themselves and whether that meeting results in um, being in phase or not in phase, which can, gives you the, actually it gives you the quantized shells of the electrons around the atom and everything, right? It gives you those, um, uh, that the loop needs to be an integer number of wavelengths, otherwise the, the electron can't exist at that distance from the atom. Well, so one of the things that I've um, been pondering too is this idea that, <clears throat> My friend, Glenn, the physicist that I, I introduced you to some of his ideas, he has this idea that entropy is a kind of forgetfulness. And this, um, so the wave coming back again, that, that has a lag in it, that has shifted just a little bit in a sense, and I'm using language loosely here, has forgotten its original, its original wave. And so that forgetfulness by the time it has come back, it's a little bit out of phase and that creates the stress. And so that forgetfulness is um, entropic. And and so um, what do you think of that? Yeah, perhaps that works. I mean, the, the, the difference in the phase tells you something about how far it was to the end of the string. And there's a, it's, um, it, tells you something about what you used to be in the past. Um, that the, if you, uh, it's like the difference between 
how exactly was I when I went through the cycle this time? And how exactly was I when I went through the cycle six cycles later? Am I a little bit different? And being able to compare yourself now to yourself in the past, um, that's the, that's the, there's some disorder in that, right? That um, if you are, a cycle that anticipates exactly what that difference is, then you're not in discord with yourself. There was no surprise there. You're a, a cycle with a little epicycle on top, a one wave with a little, another little tone added on top that adjusts for that um, discrepancy. And then there isn't any discrepancy because you're a slightly more organized, more ordered model of yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe you can do it in in tropic terms. I hadn't thought about well, it that. Way. When when but, you're when you're thinking, but about I guess the 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 stress idea and the the stress being a cause of the order, mm -hmm. maybe that's complementary to the entropic story. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's what I've been thinking is that the the stress drives learning, and learning is uh, is anti entropic. Um, mm. But if you, if you mm. take Michael's organism that has that's going to eventually get two arms and two sets of hands and they're going to match up with each other, then it's not looking backwards to see six cycles ago where it was, but it has to somehow be looking forward and measuring against what is the, I'm using language loosely, what is the ideal? Because there's um, another one of Peterson's things that he always says is the ideal is the judge. And the way I interpret that is that when you're measuring up against something that the, I think you said, uh, learning is the failure to stay the same or the success of not being static. Oh. So if you're measuring up against something, you're always either succeeding or failing in that measurement. You're always either getting there or not getting there. So if you're not there yet, then you have to try again to get there, the constant. But you're trying to get somewhere. Somehow those, um, those cells have some idea of what is equal handedness on both sides of the, the binary, right? Yeah. And you know, living things are entities that create problems that they are the best solution to, right? So if I'm a particular oscillation, I create and induce an oscillation in my environment. And the oscillation in the environment is the problem that I'm solving that I created, right? I'm the best solution to the problem I created. Um, so there's a, there's a, an interesting tension between uh, optimizing and just letting be and uh, sort of um, optimizing against an objective function versus harmonizing the um, that basic principle that I mentioned at the beginning of how natural selection works of you know, there's a there's a function which tells you which things are good, right? And you picked up on that as something like, oh, so you start, you assume that you have a function that tells you which things are good. And that's a weakness of the theory, because the things that are good, well, good for what? Good for this problem, good for this niche where the organism lives, but the niche where the organism lives was itself a mirror of the organism it created that problem into which it lives the niche mm -hmm. the problem into the problem it solves the niche in which it lives um so you know the the chord that suggests or summons an extra note to resolve it is um on the one hand a problem that the additional note solves but it's also it's just as true that that chord um, creates a context or solves a problem for that note, right? So you can have a sort of um, a back and forth between 
the context which summons the resolution and the resolution which summons the context uh, so that the idea of optimizing is just always flawed. It's always out of date. As soon as you try to optimize something, you're optimizing against the wrong thing because the, it's always- the context is always changing. Yeah. Yeah. The, this being, I like to think of it sometimes in a different metaphor as a dance, being in the dance between the environment that I'm trying to model so that it doesn't surprise me so much and the fact that the it's just as valid to say that the environment is an agent that's trying to model me so that the environment isn't changed so much. Uh, we're both getting that wrong because we're playing catch up a little bit because of these lags that I'm modeling what you did, but by the time I've got that right, you're doing something else because you're modeling what I did. And that dynamic is creating an ever-changing moving target, as it were. But if only one of you would stay still, the other one would be able to get it right. But then you would have missed the point. The whole point is that the beauty is in the mismatch, right? The beauty is in the tension that's created. The beauty is in the inability to reach an equilibrium, that back and forth, the, the dance of creating creating and resolving the tension. That's where the living is. That's where the life is. And if you, as soon as you say, well, all other things being equal, this organism is fitter than that organism. It's like, yeah, but all other things aren't equal. They're always changing. They're we're always in a dynamic. That dynamic is responsible for creating the individual in the first place. So the idea that the uh, individual is just adapting to its environment as though the environment is a stage makes no sense biologically. That's, that's not where the creative engine of evolution is. The creative in engine is in, it's in the dance, it's in the mismatch, it's in the tension that's created between an organism and its environment. Well, so it's easier for me to speak in terms of painting than it is in terms of music. So I'm going to use language that has to do with painting, but if I have a, an idea in mind of a painting that I want to create, quite often the way I'll start, because I don't like starting on a blank canvas, I'll just throw a bunch of paint on the canvas, make a big mess, create some chaos. Now I can work with that chaos. Maybe I look at the chaos and I see, um, obviously I have a context there, but I, I don't want chaos at the end. At the end, I want a unified, harmonized whole that has enough contrast to make it interesting and that has um, the <coughs> gradation and repetition and variation and balance and all these things in the painting so that it is meaningful and powerful and conveys a meaning to the viewer, okay? So um, that's what I'm working towards. So every stroke I lay down changes the context. Uh, just, I'm so sorry, Karen, can you hold on one second? Yeah. Can you tell her I'll talk to her later, please, Bruce? Sorry, Karen. Oh, that's okay. So, so every stroke I lay down changes the context. And then I have to relate to that new context in choosing the next stroke. And yeah. I have to relate to that new context in choosing the next stroke. But yeah. my relating to that context is always informed by the original idea and this hope that there will be unity and harmony and contrast and repetition and variation and gradation and balance in the final work. So there's a, a structure of possibility space within which I'm working that I have internalized. Now, if I think of that in terms of, let's say the difference between a symphony and, and jazz players, you said, early on that you didn't want to think in terms of a symphony because that's more static. It starts out with a symphony and then it breaks out into the parts and then they play the parts and the symphony comes back. But with jazz, they're kind of making it up as they go along. Mm. But even with jazz, making it up as they go along, 
they're informed by their interaction with each other, and they're also informed by some structure of possibility space that lies underneath that, mm -hmm. that makes it into music and not just cacophony, right? Mm -hmm. And and they're palpating against each other as they move forward in this possibility space to to create the song, right? So it's not just random making up a song not each person can't just be randomly making up a song as they go along they have to be interacting with each other and interacting with each other in such a way that it produces something that arises out of that existing possibility space yeah i mean you can you can imagine that each of them has a a broad potentiality right there's lots of different things that they can do mm -hmm. uh, but there is some structure to what they can do too, right? The, what they're likely to do and what they're unlikely to do, how they resolve a tension that's created by the other players or how they're unlikely to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, where they feel summoned and where they don't. And the structure of, of that, um, of those interactions produces a patterning in the space of possibilities. Not all things are equally likely. And it feels like um, sort of like even really weird notes or really weird combinations of notes would be possible if you were to set up a particular context or a particular intro or a particular lead mm -hmm. up to them, they would be the right response, but right. you would have to be, it would have to be a very particular context to do that. Um, like perhaps the focal point of the picture is is a very very particular fine resolution focal point that the eye is drawn to and there's lots of possibilities of what they could be uh, but the entire context is needed in order to make that meaningful in order to make that the right thing to put in the center uh, but you're right that um there's you know there's structure to the madness right it's not it's not a free-for-all, those potentialities have ways of interacting that are natural and ways of interacting that aren't, right? They, there are some relations that create tension and other relations that resolve them. And those are, that's the medium in which the musicians are working or the medium in which the artist is working that's feeling those tensions and responding to them. So when you're talking about the your viscoelastic, mm. you, you were you using that simply as a a thought example, or um, were you actually thinking that there is some sort of structure inherent in the universe along which things? fall and relax and fall so and relax. yeah mostly when i developed that work so that's the work on natural induction um networks of viscoelastic connections uh that could be implemented as a literal network in all sorts of different substrates right so what's a network of viscoelastic connections a, a network is just some things with some connections between them uh Elastic connections mean that it doesn't matter how you push the things on either end of that connection, the connection doesn't change, right? The connection is unchanged, but the things on either end can be changed by the connection. Um, so an example of a, an elastic connection is just an, a perfect spring, right? If I have two masses connected by a perfect spring, then I can extend the spring and when I let it go, it goes back to where it was before or compress the spring and let it go and it goes back to where it was before. It's unchanged by that interaction. The spring is unchanged by that interaction. But a plastic material is one where you can extend it and it stays extended or you compress it and it stays compressed. So viscoelastic is in between. It means it's partly elastic, it springs back, but it doesn't quite spring back all the way. Or when you compress it, it springs back to increase in length, but it doesn't quite go back all the way. So there's a little bit of memory in the system in a viscoelastic connection. So um, a network of units connected by elastic interactions can do 
any kind of computation. And it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about neurons connected by synapses or genes connected by transcription factors or people connected by friendships. They can all compute, those networks of those linkages can all compute the same kind of thing if you arrange the linkages in the same way. That's the sort of substrate independence of algorithms. But the more difficult question is, yeah, okay, but how can they be arranged to do interesting computations? In principle, a network of con elastic connections can do interesting computations, but only if they're arranged correctly to do interesting computations. How do they get arranged? Well, you might say, well, gene networks get arranged by natural selection. You change the networks at random, and if they are fitter, they get retained, and if they're not, they don't. But neural networks change a different way. Neural networks change by learning. Uh, a learning rule like neurons that fire together, wire together, changes the strengths of the connections between the neurons, and that changes the behavior of the network. So that's a different mechanism, neurons that fire together, wire together, whereas the way that gene networks change over time is just random variation and selection. But it turns out that actually the way in which variation and selection changes gene regulatory connections uh, experiences selective pressures, which are the same as Hebb's rule, the same as neurons that fire together, wire together. So two genes which are expressed at the same time, uh, which are selected to express at the same time, are also implicitly selected to increase the strength of their transcription factor connection between each other. Whereas if one gene is selected to be expressed when the other gene is selected to be off and vice versa, then a negative um, connection between those two genes is favored by selection. So selection changes gene networks in the same way that learning changes neural networks. But when you think about, you know, both of those things, they seem sort of special, right? One involves natural selection. The other one involves a learning mechanism. But it feels like, you know, that's interesting, but it's special. It applies to neural networks. It applies maybe to gene networks, but it's not going to apply to other kinds of networks and other kinds of systems. But the work that I did with Chris Buckley at Sussex University shows that no, actually that's a really general principle that applies to any network where the connections give way under stress. So Hebbian learning, neurons that fire together, wire together, is the same as saying if the connection between these two neurons is under stress, change the connection in a way that relieves that stress. So if they were firing at the same time, increasing the strength of the connection just makes it easier for them to fire at the same time. If they were firing at different times, making a negative connection between the two neurons makes it easier for them to fire at different times. So the Hebb's rule is just a particular instance of the general principle of easing frustrated relationships in a network. And if you have literally a system of masses connected by springs, then the springs which are under stress will deform slightly if they're not perfect springs in the same direction as Hebb's rule. They will yield a little bit in the direction that makes less tension in the spring. And that means that a system of masses connected by springs, by slightly imperfect springs, learns in the same way that a neural network learns or learns in the same way that a gene network evolves. So it doesn't need to be an evolutionary system to do learning, and it doesn't need to be a neural system to do learning. Any system of a network with components that are connected by viscoelastic connections learns in the same way. So when I was saying earlier that the vibrations or dynamics in a system create stress and the stress causes the relationships between the components to change, that's one way, that's one kind of system in which that could happen. And that means that that could happen in systems that aren't brains and in systems that aren't gene networks, in systems that aren't even evolutionary units. It could happen in things like an ecosystem where the relationships between species 
are stressed by the mismatch of the climax community to the ecological conditions. If that creates a stress, then uh, the ecological relationships will yield in the direction that relieves that stress. And that creates a distributed memory in the ecosystem, which remembers that configuration and recalls that configuration more easily in future, which means it's less surprised, which means it's learned from that past experience. It could also apply in a social network or an organization where an organization that's set up to have particular working relationships between its people that might be implemented in terms of you know, rule books of management structures, but also in terms of um, you know, resource flows and availability of materials or you know, little bits of post-it notes that people put on the equipment, you know, whatever the nature, whatever the substrate of those relationships are in the organization, when the organization is put under stress, those relationships begin to deform a little bit. It's like, oh, the, the supply of, of this supply chain has got interrupted, which means it's broken that relationship. Or um, the working together of these two people is now uh, to relieve the stress that they were experienced. They've developed a new local working relationship to make that interaction, to streamline that relationship. And those changes in organizational structure of the relationships between the people and, and, and infrastructure of the organization causes the organization to learn by the same principles that a neural network learns or a gene network evolves or the masses and springs learn. And it doesn't require any of the people to be in control of the reorganization to do that. It doesn't require a person to say, you know what, let's change this organization because we need to be more efficient or we need to increase our throughput or we need to uh, increase our profit. That's the learning of the system is systemic and happens spontaneously through the adjustment of the relationships in the system caused in a directed fashion by where the stress is on those relationships. All of those levels are still working towards something that is better. Well, or they're just trying to find ease, right? If they are in a situation where there is stress that is caused by discord between the system and its environment, then that discord or stress causes reorganization. So they're just trying to accommodate or adjust to find an easier life, right? And that's like being summoned to play the note that was missing from the chord is that that mechanism of creating a vibration which reorganizes something to provide the part that was missing is the is the sort of fitting in or fitting together um which we recognize as an organism being well fitted to its environment which is different from saying it was maximized for something it's a sort of a harmonic or um uh accommodated a mirror of um, reflection of the uh, dynamics that were causing the stress. Well, you're still speaking in terms of being well fitted to the environment. That means the environment is still playing a role. Sure. So, you know, this the environment, is the... there, there's something better or the environment is, is the environment what's summoning the fittedness yeah it's creating the tension it's creating the tension or the stress in the system but it's the system is also creating the tension or the stress in the environment and the lag between the two it's like the system is really meeting itself right it's like i did something that caused a, a, an effect in the environment now i'm experiencing the new environment that i created but it's a little bit out of phase with me. I'm meeting my I'm meeting myself slightly out of phase with my own reflection, and that causes stress in me. But when you were talking about this very early on, in terms of the uh, computer using the algorithm and have opponent processing, you were saying that the opponent processing is causing each one to change, but it's not necessarily going anywhere. It's not necessarily getting 
making th something better. It's just they're they're just changing each other. Yes, so uh, A causes B to evolve and B causes A to evolve, uh, but they didn't create a higher level complex. So the the thing that I think is missing there is to do with whether they find a harmonic relationship that makes a whole that's more than the sum of the parts. Um, but the harmonic relationship is really the core of your your whole theory then the necessity yeah. of that harmonic relationship yeah well so say some more about that then because i've interrupted you so many times yeah. <laughs> so um <clears throat> so if you have uh if you have um a, a, a pendulum on a string and you have a whole bunch of other pendulums of different lengths that are hanging off a common string. This is called Barton's pendulum. So if you swing one of those pendulums, it creates a little bit of wobble in the, you know, the, there's the string that it's swinging on, but then there's the shared string that they're all hanging from. It creates a little wobble in that shared string. And that shared string is, you know, just nudging all of the other pendulums which are hanging from it. Now, if there is another pendulum in that collection, which is the same length as the one that you were originally applying energy to, then the wobble that it receives at the top of the string will resonate with the natural frequency of that pendulum, which means each time it's going this way, it gets a little nudge that goes that way. And each time it's coming back again, and it gets a little nudge that's going back again. And those energies build up slowly over time, you know, just like swinging your legs on a swing at the playground. You have to get the swing of your legs in the same tempo as the natural frequency of your pendulum swing on the swing, right? Mm -hmm. So if the little nudges are the same frequency as the natural frequency of the pendulum, then it picks up over time, it picks up energy from those little nudges and turns, it gets into a larger and larger swing. So that's a simple example of resonance where two things have the same frequency. But it turns out that another pendulum that can also pick up energy is a pendulum that is half the length or a pendulum that is twice the length. And in those cases, it doesn't get a nudge every time it swings but it gets a nudge every second time it swings so it's not going to resonate as strongly it only resonates half as strongly if it only gets a nudge every half a time instead of every every time but it still builds up energy over time now in between being equal length and being twice the length what's going to happen then if you have something which is has a natural frequency that's a little bit faster than the driving pendulum, then it gets a nudge when it's going forwards. And then it gets another nudge when it's going forward, but it was a little bit late. And then it gets another nudge when it's going forward, but it was really late. And then it gets another little nudge when it was coming back. So then it gets another little nudge when it was coming back. And then it gets another nudge when it was coming back. And then you wait a bit longer. Oh, it's getting another nudge when it comes forward. So the nudges are not building up properly because sometimes they're building up and sometimes they're canceling out. And the net effect of that is that the pendulum that doesn't resonate doesn't build up um, the, the energy doesn't build up in something if it doesn't resonate. So what, what are the lengths that do build up and the lengths that don't? Well, those are the harmonic ratios, right? It means that the number of swings you get on this one is has an integer relationship to the number of swings that you get on that one. And if they do, if they have a ratio that's a simple ratio, like two to one or two to three, the perfect fifth, then they will resonate to one another. And if they have a, 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 a ratio that is, how should we put it, less harmonic, like 26, 27, right, then like nearly all the time they are canceling out. But if you wait long enough, there's a, there is a little bit of a residual that the product of 26 and 27, whatever that is, eventually they get back into the same rhythm again. And whatever that, whatever that nudge was mm -hmm. is in the same place again, but it's really, really weak now, right? That, that nudge, 
that resonance is really weak. So the harmonic relationships tell you uh, about what kind of um, what kind of uh, scale and frequency relationships communicate with each other and what scale and frequency of relationships don't communicate with each other. And the interesting thing about that is that, you know, there are big gaps, like equal ratio communicates very strongly, two to one communicates half as strongly, two thirds or, or one and a half communicates the next most strongly. And in between that, there are big gaps where two frequencies just almost can't see each other at all. And that gives you a very particular, but you know, deeply mathematical structure to what kinds of things are natural, what kinds of things fit together, what kinds of things don't, what tensions are created when you play these two, but it's then begging for a third one to resolve it. Um, that those mathematical relationships between those ratios and the leftover ratios, which are the complements or the, the beat or the difference tones between those uh, frequencies, that's the, that's the language, right? That's the language of the physics. It's the language of music, but it's the language of the physics of the, of the resonance between anything that's oscillating. And it doesn't matter whether those things which are oscillating or cycling are pendulums or whether one of them is an electrical cycle uh, between uh, coupled neurons in your brain, or one of them is an electrical cycle between um, two cells with gap junctions in your tissues, or it's a gene regulatory cycle between two genes inside your cell, or it's a hormone cycle between your pituitary and your something else in your body. Whatever that thing is that's producing a cycle, if that's producing little nudges at a particular frequency, it will resonate with one of those other cycles if and only if it's in a harmonic relationship to it or to the extent that it's in a harmonic relationship to it. So that gives you a way to connect uh, cycles and rhythms and vibrations throughout an organism and any system uh, that moves between substrates and moves be between scales that um, gives you a uh, a language in which some things are allowed and some things are not allowed or some things create tension and some things beg for a particular resolution that language is that mathematical language of the harmonies and the ratios gives you the constraint and the resolution that we were talking about in the art or talking about in the music but that's that's the that's the structural form of the you know the rules of of living systems and learning systems well, so is there a way to <clears throat> develop experiments or research to figure out if that's what's happening at all these, I mean, like, <clears throat> you know, the liver is doing its work and the heart is doing its work. <clears throat> are they, are they resonating at certain frequencies so that they're matching up with the work that has to be done? Or how, I mean, how does that so there's lots, you know, there's, <clears throat> I think at this stage, it would be fair to say there's lots of suggestive evidence. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely the case that all living things and all the components of all living things do whatever they do in a cyclic fashion. There's almost nothing that's just do it once and forget it. Mm -hmm. Everything that the, you know, from the heartbeat um, to the, uh, brain waves to the cell cycle everything is rhythmic everything is cyclic obviously everything is connected right because otherwise it wouldn't be one coherent organism mm -hmm. so it's true that they're cyclic it's true that they have different frequencies and it's true that they're all connected the question is are they connected in the sort of you know a causes b causes c chain like way or are they connected in the a resonates with B, B resonates with C, C resonates with D, uh, harmonic way that the, you know, then, then the harmonic difference between A and B resonates with C. Um, is that is it in that structure of the harmonic relationships is the thing that's um, interesting. So one thing, one way to approach the sort of um, the empirical question is 
is the same way in which um, the empirical questions about evolution by natural selection were approached by Darwin, right? Uh, he couldn't show empirically that evolution by natural selection produced an explanation for the biological changes that he wanted to explain. But he could show evidence that, that all of the things that were necessary for evolution by natural selection were present in biological populations. And if all of those things that were necessary were present, natural selection must logically follow. It must be happening. If you have a population of entities that are reproducing, the parents are like, the offspring are like the parents, the offspring are not all the same, the differences are passed on and the differences make a difference to your survival and reproduction, and you can verify that all of those things are true, then evolution by natural selection must follow, right? It must be the case that the things that leave more descendants uh, and pass on those differences will be types that increase in frequency in the population. It follows logically from those parts. And I think that it's possible to show that a whole bunch of the things which are necessary and sufficient for that kind of resonant dynamic to occur are present in biological systems. Um, so I think that there's a, a, a way to get close to saying it must be happening because all of the necessary components are there. It couldn't not be happening. But another thing, another type of evidence that's suggestive is the sort of puzzles and anomalies of things which just don't make sense with any other story. Um, one, um, you know, so one example is Mike Levin's double-headed planarians, right? So he can change a flatworm from a single-headed flatworm to a two-headed flatworm without changing anything genetically just by changing the bioelectric patterns in the tissues mm -hmm. so the bioelectric patterns in the tissues are what they are downwardly causing changes in gene expression which change the differentiation of the cell types and organize them into a head at the end that used to be the tail so that's pretty extraordinary that's a sort of a top-down causation story already but what's more extraordinary about that is that when the worms divide, divide by fissioning, just cutting in half, both halves grow two-headed descendants. So that inheritance between one generation and the next is not in the genes because you didn't change the genes. It's in a pattern which is passed from one generation to the next that's at the macro scale, not at the micro scale. So that kind of heritability of a dynamical process, which is self-sustaining, is evidenced in that example in a way which doesn't involve genes. Um, another example is oh, so, so in that case, it's some kind of a some kind of a memory. Yeah, well, right. it's memory in this in at least in the sense that it's persistent across generations, and it's well, in the same way as when he takes one of those tadpoles and gives it makes a designer tadpole so that the face is all in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes a frog, instead of the eye just moving so many millimeters as it would be programmed to do, the eye actually moves into the correct space for that yeah. eye. And that, so, so that it's making a correct face from an anomalous face. So there's some kind of memory of what the face is supposed to be, or something is summoning the correct face. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. So you need an explanation for how that works, which is hard to do in a bottom-up story. Um, another example, which I find really extraordinary is the deer antlers. So the, you know, the Can deer you explain antlers, that they, just briefly for people yeah. who might not have heard so that the, story? The deer antlers grow under felt with a blood supply each season and then fall off at the end of the season. And there's a characteristic shape for a particular species of deer at a particular age. Uh, sometimes, though, if the, if the growth, if the antler is damaged during growth in a way which disrupts the surface of the bone, 
uh, then it'll grow a little spur in an uncharacteristic shape, an odd little spur that's not supposed to be there. And well, that seems fair enough. It was damaged and it's, you know, it's, it's just uh, produced an anomaly. But the really weird thing is that the antler falls off at the end of the season and next season when the antlers grow, they have the same anomaly in the same place. It's like, how the hell does that happen? That suggests that an adjustment to the phenotype is being inherited to the next generation of antler, so not the next generation of organism, but the next season of antler, in some way that that information is not in the antler. It's not local because that fell off. So that information is being transferred somewhere out of the antler, presumably into the rest of the organism, into the deer, in such a way which is held and then reproduced next season uh, to produce an antler with the same anomaly in the next in the next season. How does that work, right? If well, you there, think there's the a story the antler, that I that I think is true about, and I can't remember if it's birds, a particular species of birds, or if it's butterflies. You know, they're always migrating every season. Uh -huh. There, there's one group that migrate a certain path where during many seasons of that migration, there was a huge forest. And so they would fly around the forest and then get back on their path. But then the forest was cut down. Succeeding generations continue to fly around the forest where it used to be. It seems like the same principle that some that that information, that knowledge, that learning is stored somewhere mm. in the collective, mm. continues from generation to generation, even when the yeah, and they're not the same individuals, right? It's not the but it's not the same butterfly that flew it last right. year. Yeah. Interesting. Well, just like uh, when a when a caterpillar dissolves into goo. And the brain, it, it has learned something in its caterpillar world, dissolves into goo, everything is gone, the brain, all that stuff. And then when it turns into a butterfly, it retains the information that it learned when it was a caterpillar. Yeah. So the information is not in the neural connections. So the caterpillar had a little brain with neurons with connections in it. And the conventional story is that the information that's stored in the brain is stored in the strength of the connections between the neurons. But if that all turns to goo, and the new brain that is created in the butterfly has the same memory, then the memory wasn't in the connections. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's possible to explain phenomena like that with a song based kind of uh, resonance that you, with resonance, you can transfer information carried in the song between substrates and between scales and in particular you can do things like well if the gene regulation network is playing a little song then that organizes the tissues to make the or the cells to make the tissues to make the organs to make the organism great the genes upwardly controlled the shape and form of the organism but the shape and form of the organism has that shape and form because it's the shape and form that resonates to the song that the genes were singing. And it continues to sing that song, even if you took away the genes, even if you stopped the song in the genes, it would put the song back in the dynamics of the genes, right? It goes both ways. That um, if, um, if you think about it this way, right? So if I swing this pendulum and it makes that pendulum resonate, I can stop the first one and then when I let it go again, this one will make that one resonate. It goes back again, right? And that's mm -hmm. true, even if the pendulums are of different lengths, so long as they're in a harmonic relationship, you can go from the two to one and the one to the two. So you can move between scales and between substrates bi-directionally. Everything is reversible when you're doing it with the harmonic relationships. The harmonic relationships, that resonance relationships works between physical scales and between physical substrates. So if the shape of the antler was a response to the song that the genes in the growth plate were singing, then changing the shape of the antler, that the adult shape of the antler is a sort of resonant, like the natural frequency of the antler, the natural song of the antler is 
compatible with, resonating with the song of the gene expression. If you forcibly change the shape of the antler, it forcibly changes the shape of the gene expression. That they, that's, if that's reversible, then it could explain how the cells of the growth plate or perhaps more distributed dynamics in the organism um, have uh, changed because you changed the physiology. It's the, it's the reversibility that contravenes the central dogma, right? The central dogma is that information only flows outwards. But you know, we already know that all of the links in that chain have backward reactions as well. Like the only link in the chain that doesn't have direct evidence for backward reactions is the very first one, the, the um, transcription step, right? You can't change the protein and get that to go directly back into the sequence. But all of the others have backward reactions. Um, and if those backward reactions exist, then how do you know whether the causal process is going that way or the causal process is going this way? But to get those connections, you need a way to have um, a flow in both directions and either you know the the conventional story the the patch on the conventional story about how does the information flow backwards when it does is because well natural selection must have evolved a way of getting the information from the phenotype back into the gene expression or something a, a, a special feedback mechanism that was itself evolved for the purposes of having a feedback mechanism but i i don't think you need i don't think you need that story i think that when when the way in which the micro scale controlled the macro scale was resonance, there is already a connection back again. It's already, it's like for free, you get the connection between the macro scale and the micro scale. It's a simpler story than saying you evolved a mechanism that was for the purpose of reversing that causal story. So, you know, it's, it would be early days to say that that was empirical evidence that was convincing, but mm -hmm. um, you know I think that there are there's a sort of a, a confluence of you know the the logic of the original story can't answer some questions. Some of the biological biological puzzles just don't fit with that story. They need a downward causation story. Um, the all of the mechanical requirements for a resonance story to be there are there and it provides i would argue a reasonably simple mechanistic account of how all of those linkages would work and we end up with an account where the organism as a whole is a real thing instead of something that was explained away Instead of, you know, instead of just, ah, there's nothing to see here. It's just genes. It's just molecules bumping into each other and making other molecules do stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a bunch of good reasons to, to give it more investigation, but I wouldn't, I think it would be fair to say there's no slam dunk evidence at this stage. Well, so are, are you going to be um, publishing this at some point or? Yeah, I hope so. That's how my job with colleagues. That's, so that that's it, how academic it, jobs work, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I have lots of plans for publishing. At the moment, I'm working on um, a sort of a, a calculus of songs. At the time that I mo made those videos that you've watched, I, I would, I was seeking to summon such a calculus, but didn't have one. Right? I want a calculus that links shape and form and geometry with computation, optimization and learning uh, and does so using the language of songs and harmonies and resonance. Um, and I think I have a calculus that does that now that links songs with computation so I can convert between um, algorithmic functions and equivalent songs and back again so that there's a the language of the song is a formal programming language that enables you to compute things in a computationally universal way 
if you saw what I'd actually done so far, you would realize I was stretching a bit there, but that's what I mean. That's what I'm reaching for, right? <laughs> well, you have to stretch a little bit to get the stress going, to get the creativity, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Let's put the vision there and then let it summon the response to it. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, and and when when are the videos going to be available? The five. Yeah, I don't know. So far, uh, I um, I was thinking today actually that I don't know that there's a good reason not to make them public. So you know they're work in progress. The you know the ideas aren't published, but it's not like I feel proprietary or protective about them. It's just I was just holding on to them because they were a bit work in progress um but since my ideas have developed a little bit further since making those videos a few months ago um actually the detail that i filled in since then suggests that the things which were speculative then i i'm now more confident about so it's probably okay uh for them to go public i'll have a little think about that would it be okay for me to link to them in my um, link the ones that you sent me in the video? Uh, let me sleep on it, but I think okay. the answer is yes. Okay, because I mean, this won't be publishing probably until after Christmas. I think I want people to be able to focus on it and not be all tied up with their hol holiday <laughs> thinking. Yeah. But I haven't. <laughs> because you know, I know I there's going to be a lot of interest in this one. <clears throat> Thank you. I, you know, I haven't put them on my own website yet, but uh, yeah, I don't see why not now. I was, I was holding on to them for a bit, but I think I'm, I think. I'm well, I'll, I'll check in with you before I put them on. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. This has been fantastic. And if you ever would be willing to talk again, I would be all in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, it's been very enjoyable. And I mean, you know, it's new, it's relatively new territory and I'm, you know, I've spent, I've done many conversations and interviews about natural induction and the viscoelastic networks and stuff. And I know how to describe that stuff now, but the song stuff is relatively new and I don't really, I often don't know exactly where to begin and um, how to make the necessary connections and how to present what the motivation is and stuff. So it's really useful to me to, to have a go at doing that with you. Um, and it's been, you know, very stimulating conversation. Thank you. So you have a wonderful holiday. And, yeah, you uh, too. Yeah. And maybe yeah. I'll see you in the new year. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Rachel. I look forward to speaking okay. again. Me too. Bye for now. Bye-bye.